Okay, the first thing that we do is we mark the uh, orientation of the sacrum. The sacrum has a dorsal uh, flip. And so I'm just gonna move the drape over and we're gonna get the orientation of the sacrum here. Give me the marker pen, picture. Okay, shoot that, please. Shoot that. Shoot that. Again. One more. Okay, so the orientation of the sacrum. Just make kind of a crude marks for the orientation of the sacrum. Mainly because superior is not this way. Superior is this way, in, oriented to the sacrum, and inferior is this way. So you have inferior, superior, and this is uh, dorsal and ventral. And so we want to make sure and operate the whole thing by the orientation of the sacrum, not the orientation of the patient, because the sacrum has a prominent dorsal flip. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to get a mark as close to S1 and S2 as we possibly can. So we're going to we get a mark here, and then we're going to go over to the fluoro picture. So that's right at S12. We're going to go a little bit dorsal to that picture. And picture. So that's right in the middle of S1. And so that's our start, and we're going to make the incision here. Small incision, it's only about a centimeter incision about 1.2 centimeters is all you'll need. Right here at that point, because that's our starting point for S1. And we we'll always start with the rigid access. So the rigid access needle is, is here. So we always put a mark on it, this mark, and also the mark for directionality, because this particular needle doesn't have a mark on directionality, so we don't really know where it goes. And this is a single bevel needle, as I used previously for vertebral augmentation. There is also a diamond tip, but I like the directionality of this. And so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start, and we can switch to the fluoro images. And we can start by lining this up. And we're going to go in the three screws that we'll put in. I'm, I'm only going to put in one picture there. We'll be uh, bony corridor of S1, bony corridor of S2, and a, a short screw headed toward the S1 frame. And picture that. Okay. Picture. 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 Okay, shoot that. Okay. So the hardest part about this is getting the picture targeting just right. Shoot that. And so we need to go a little ventral picture. Not that much ventral. Picture. Picture. Just give me the live. Off. Picture. Picture. So. This is the center of S1. I'm going to move it just a little bit superior. Picture that. I like that. Picture. So we'll get a start here with the mallet. So I'm going to mallet it in a little bit here. I want the tip to go a little bit dorsal. And so I'm going to change my directional capability of that needle to put it a little bit dorsal picture. And so we will 
place the needle hammered in gently in the middle of S1. And I can start to feel a little bit of resistance there. So what we can do is we can turn it around AP. And this is going to be a little bit of a three view, three step view. So we have lateral, we have inlet view, and we have outlet views. Yeah, directly AP. No, oh, second. Say so directly AP. Pull toward you. Go ahead and adjust that. Rotate 90 degrees left. Straight up and down. Go ahead and pull toward you, get an AP shot. Okay, so we're headed toward S1 through uh, the ilium. So let's take a view here, cranial. So we're gonna get a pelvic outlet view. So you can see the orientation of the sacrum. No, 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 like this, yeah. See the orientation of the sacrum. You can see the neural foramina that are bunched up on one another. What we wanna do is get an outlet view an outlet view to uh, check out and have the, the sacrum laid on FOSS to us. So we get a nice view of the sacrum, um, kind of on FOSS to its dorsal tilt. So you see the screw coming in right there. You can see the screw coming in and you can see the picture. S1 foramen right there, and then you can see picture, the S2 foramen right here. All right, so now we're gonna switch back to the lateral view. That's a fine orientation, you can leave it right there. Raise it up a bit and straight up and down is fine. Good, so we've got nice targeting. If anything, we might move it a little bit inferior. So I can feel a nice resistance right there. So we're headed right short smack right in the middle of S1. The vestigial disc of S1 and 2 is right below that. And uh, we are going to go ahead and transgress the SI joint. Rami, mm -hmm. let me introduce to you guys uh, Rami. Uh, he's a fellow. And before you start hammering, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. I'm Rami. I'm a pain fellow at University of Washington, Seattle. Great. So uh, shoot that. And we're just going to go ahead and just give it a couple of taps right there. Good. So you can hear the ch change in tone as it goes through the SI joint. So it's much harder than the surrounding ilium. Go ahead. So it looks very good. A couple more taps. And we're not really worried about any of the foramina because right here is the S1 bony corridor. So you can actually drive it from here all the way to the other side to the ilium and really out the skin, not really hurt anything. Is this, is, uh, this is a safe corridor right there. So I'm gonna turn you back around, see how it's drifting a little bit inferior. I'm gonna turn the directional part of the needle superior, give it a couple more taps, and then we're gonna come around to the pelvic outlet view. So go ahead and swing back around AP, give me an outlet view if you would. Yeah. So we managed to drive the needle through the ring. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, 
sure we scored some points there somehow. So go ahead and drive it in a little bit. And we want to take it to about the 11 o'clock position close to, go ahead, the S1 foramen. So we're going to take it right about here. So you've got a long way to go. Right there. And on this cadaver, we've kind of hubbed the needle, so we're going to change. We're going to take the stylet out. We're going to change to the Steinman pin. And this is a sharp Steinman pin, so this thing will go forward pretty easily. So we'll advance this picture. And it's already at the target position right there, kind of 11 o'clock. It can even go a little farther as we put the instrumentation in. This thing will have a tendency to, uh, to jump on us. But that's okay because it's through the bony corridor. Uh, this right here is a soft tissue dilator. It has a, the large threads on it. It also has sizes right here that will measure the sizes according to the Steinman pin depth. So we can figure out exactly what size of screw we need. So we're going to go ahead and put this in. This is put in through a rotation, right, like that. Screw it in with the soft tissue threads. It's designed specifically. And we read what size we need, and let's see, picture where, let me see what that looks like. We have an 11 and a half by 45 loaded up, so we're gonna use that. So we'll take um, dilator two. Rami, did you put this in? Just put it over and just righty tighty and screw it on down. Where's our extender? Where's our extender? Another one. We need an extender for this diamond pin. What the long Sharp. one? Yeah. What the long one with the extender? How long? That is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just a second. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have the wrong Steinman pen in here, but we'll make it work. Picture? Picture? Okay. All right. Give me a public inlet view. Come back. Same. It's like a Ferguson view. <clears throat> Same thing, except a lot, lot more, a lot more caudal tilt. Yeah. There you go. The one that okay. So this is the uh, pelvic inlet view. We want to make sure we're not too far anterior. Lumbosacral trunk sits anterior, and then we need to make sure we're not too anterior. So we will put the the working channel. Give it a couple of taps. And we will take internal dilators out. Shoot that, please. OK. And then we'll take the implant. All right, Rami. Mm -hmm. Let you dilate. This is a ratcheted um, screwdriver. Mm -hmm. And the implant is hooked on the end. Right. Just hold that for a second. I'm gonna so the implant is here. This is a 3D titanium printed screw. This is, has a lagging capability. You see the thread pitch differential. It's hollow. It self augers by putting some of the alien bone in there. It also self taps, and so we don't need to use a screw. You can use a, a drill, but we, we won't on this one, because most all of the ones that we do, I've been able to just put it in with a self tapping feature. And so this is put in with the inserter. We'll go over the Steinman pin, and it's a ratcheted device. And so we'll just put it in with a ratcheted type of screwdriver action right over the Steinman pin. All right, Ronnie, take over that. Not like this. Lean into it. Yeah. And remember, we're going through bone, so this takes quite a bit of force. You gotta put your, your body weight into it. 
We want that SI joint to be locked down. All right, come back to the outlet view, please. All right, shoot that. Good. So now we're going to bring it right up to the SI joint. And what we're going to feel is it's going to get a lot tighter right up to the SI joint. Picture. Oh, look at that. We're advancing the uh, little ring there. Okay. We'll see if we can drive that whole thing in there. Picture? Okay, so that is not going to work. So we'll come out with this and we'll go down to S2 where there is no ring. Okay, back lateral. So that ring is something on the outside of the cadaver, but we will go, I'll show you an S, demonstrate an S2 access. Picture. Picture. Okay, so the bone is deficient right there on this cadaver. So I'm going to give you and try to demonstrate a framel screw. Picture. So we'll try to get put a screw just right below that little metallic ring. Picture. Okay, come back around, AP. All right, so <clears throat> back lateral. The alien appears to be a little bit deficient right there. Picture. I'm going to put try to put one just right below that ring. Picture. Okay. Picture. All right, back around, pelvic outlet view. Okay, so we'll just get below the ring and just kind of above that foramen. Okay, I'm going to kind of go a little bit rapid fire here. So we'll go with the Steinman pin.
to it. The long, never. Picture? All right, so we're through that bounty corridor. We'll go with dilator one and dilator two. And the working channel. Okay. Picture that. Give me a pelvic inlet view. So, pull toward you. So, we want to make sure we're not too far anterior or posterior to that anterior portion of the the uh, sacrum right where the lumbosacral trunk and later on the uh, lumbosacral plexus runs. All right, Ryan, let's give it a second try here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you started. Okay, picture. All right, we'll shove that ring out of the way. Come back to the pelvic outlet view. Go ahead and just drive that in there. All right, watch your elbow. Let's get a shot. Okay, go ahead and drive a little farther. All right, so at this point in time, just drive a little bit farther. Couple of turns, that's good right there. Arc about 15 degrees toward you. We'll get take a look down the SI joint. And we can also see the back part of the ilium. So we want to make sure and drive it where the threaded portions, one or is on the side of the sacrum, the front part, the back part. So a couple more turns. The back part is still on the ilium side, and the back end of the screw is right up against the back part of the ilium like you see there. Mm -hmm. So now we just unscrew it, take the whole thing out, take the Steinman pin out, picture there, and that is an S1 screw. So let's take a direct AP shot. <laughs> Great, and uh, let's take a pelvic inlet view. Looks wonderful, and then back lateral. So what we'll do is we'll put a screw at S1, we'll put a screw through the S2 bony corridor. Uh, in this cadaver, there basically is no bony substance in the, in the ilium for whatever reason. But we'll put uh, one at the S2 bony corridor, Wonderful. And then we will put one in the uh, S1 foramen. So background, let's get another AP shot. Let's get another AP shot just to, to leave one there for discussion purposes. And then we will put a short one, short of the foramen, usually uh, a, a smaller diameter screw. These are 11 and a half by 45. Uh, the bigger screws are 11 and a half by uh, in diameter. The smaller screws are nine and a half by in diameter. So usually we'll go, um, for example, one of the most common combinations is 11 and a half by 60, 11 and a half by 50 for S1 and S2 respectively, followed by, you know, a nine and a half by 35 for a short pyramidal screw. And that is it. That is uh, SI fusion. Questions, comments? Any questions? If you have any questions, just tap on your, your uh, microphone. Any questions, guys? What CPT are you using for this one? This is a 27279. And that will maintain. Yeah, so the, the only change is with the posterior approach. The posterior approach used to be a 27279, now it's, it's not. It's going to be a T-code as of 2023. Um, 
And then what, starting in 2024, it will be a Category 1 code. And it will be, it, it will go get another, um, it will probably be revalued through the RUC process. It will get another code, but the lateral approach here has not changed at all. This will be the same code as it always has been. Any other questions? Yes. Given that change in the CPT code, or CPT code for the posterior approach, uh, is there any scenario when you're using the posterior approach at this point or all lateral approach? Well, you can use the posterior approach, but you know you have to understand a T code is, is paid for just intermittently through each one of the MACs and it's, there's no guarantee for payment. So the way that this works is it is paid through each of the separate MACs you have to have discussions with the Medicare administrative contractor. They will do uh, a crosswalk to the closest type of procedure, and they will put a value of that on, uh, on the, the procedure that is crosswalked, and they will come up with a value. They will place the value on the posterior approach, and then that's what you will get. It would be given in um, terms of RVUs. You won't have a professional technical fee. It'll be a single fee given to the hospital. So even if the facility gets paid for it, there's no guarantee that the physician will get paid for it. That's right. And similarly, if you do the mild procedure, that's currently a T code. So similarly, as Doug was explaining here, uh, it shouldn't deter you necessarily from doing it, um, especially to Medicare patient but there is more work to be done. They do want to make sure you've documented everything appropriately, uh, look at the results, and, and then you get reimbursement. As Doug said, the pro fee is not always covered, so you may have the patient sign an advanced beneficiary notice uh, so that they can pay you uh, if, they don't, if the payer doesn't pay you. And a shout out to Doug for doing a lot of the work uh, to ensure that the code remains because it's really important that we have access to different therapies Doug, can you tell us some of the pros and cons with the lateral approach versus the posterior approach? Yeah, so the lateral approach is more of an anatomic approach. Uh, it's got more literature support to it. Basically, um, nearly all of the data we have, minus the past couple of years, have been a posterior approach. So it's kind of tried and true. It's uh, fairly easy to do. I mean, this is not something that if you can place the rigid axis, stein, uh, rigid axis in, uh, you can follow that with the Steinman pin. And once the rigid access is placed, I mean, basically the case is over. And it's the same as vertebral augmentation or any of the other times we use a larger gauge jam sheeting. Um, the posterior approach is something that uh, until we get a better handle on it, until uh, we have better uh, data, which we are close, um, it's the, the advantage of the posterior approach is it's very safe. And the category one application that we put forward, we had plenty of data on the poster approach to support a level one code. So um, looking forward into the future in 2024, uh, everything will be back open again. Uh, and it's, it's likely that the code will be devalued. I hope not. But um, once the original code gets valued, all of the codes in the family get revalued. So just kind of uh, hold on to your chairs and, and hope for the best about the 27279 uh, code, which is what this is. Hopefully this will maintain its value, but it's done, done very well so far. And both of these approaches have shown great utility. They've shown great possibility and, and good literature data. Well, awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Beal.